brethren, we'll, uh, we'll start the second section this afternoon. Uh, I'd also like to remind you that after this ends, Dr. Bullock will have uh, his book available. Uh, this is a, uh, the books are $42. $42. List and, price, so. Yeah, that's the list price. And uh, so we'll do that. Come on in, Mr. Bell. Somebody's trying to come in. Oh, he's in town. <laughs> Brother Junior Deacon. Uh, All right. I'll turn it over. And I see a couple copies of the hardcover, which is now a museum piece. It is. That's one of those horrible things that sometimes you look on Amazon and it's sort of starting at a thousand dollars kind of thing, which I don't. You have to wonder who's doing those things. So they they don't make the hardcover anymore. They they kind of move out of the academic presses, kind of get out of that business. Actually, it's sold in hardcover. So but I think they thought that was rare, but. Um, sadly, that's that. And um, so I'd be happy to sign. If you brought them, I'll be happy to sign them. Um, so Freemasonry, first golden age. Uh, um, this is Masonry after the Revolution. Um, you might have some questions about, you know, about that title there, the, um, the first golden age. Um, if you, um, um, essentially, sort of the, the period of you know of enormous success, of enormous importance, um, of enormous um, um, just general significance in the in the in the te in the community. So, people used to actually the, the the sense, and this is this actually comes out of there since we're a small group, and you guys will forgive me if we if I digress a little bit and. Um, we'll brush through some other things if need be, um, but um, part of the um, part of the sense of history in the early 17th, early 1700s um, that Masons sort of draw upon as they're as they're creating a fraternity um, is that is that feeling that in some ways there was an earlier age where people were closer to God, where people were closer to um, People are close to reality and to truth, um, and and so that was sometimes talked about the golden age. I think, and I don't know if it has something to do with the, you know, the prophecy that Daniel Daniel creates. Remember that giant statue, the the um, is the head of gold, and then sort of heading down eventually the feet of clay, which is sometimes I think that's where we are now. The, we're down the other, <laughs> we're just down into the clay. Maybe we're down to the mud. We're clearly down the mud, but I don't think that. Um, so, so the golden age, and so that's actually that's what many of the, many of the early Freemasons who often come from well-to-do kind of backgrounds come from very learned kind of backgrounds. Many of the many of the early members were involved with the Royal Society, which is the, which is the scientific institution which is actually more than anything else spreading the scientific revolution. The idea of, of a science which is based upon, upon purely physical principles. Um, um, that is, that's there. And I think what they thought they were doing is they were seeing, you know, through a, through a lot of years of accumulated kind of messing up, through a lot of years of accumulated grime over these things, they thought they were actually seeing Rituals, things which went back, um, which went back to that early, very early age, um, and so they thought they were bringing that. That's that's one reason why they were sort of easygoing about adapting rituals, by the way, because they they thought they could see. It's not surprising that things deteriorated, you know, just over time, but particularly they've been in the hands of workmen and those sort of things rather than learned kind of people. So. They're going to take that stuff and, and buff it up and restore its kind of glory to it, that older kind of day. So I think that's, that's what's going on. So that's, that's partly behind that metaphor. Uh, but there's also, a, um, there's also a modern application. If, um, if you know something about the later 19th century um, history of Freemasonry, um, many people have talked about that period from 
say from the Civil War to 1930 or so as being the golden age of American fraternalism, of American fraternity. Um, um, actually, actually, it was an article, I think, from the, from the 20s or 30s um, written there. So, um, and, and I think that's a really important thing. And if I have time, I'll talk about that, what, what happens to masonry within that world, the sort of godfather, to give you a preview, um, godfather to a whole series of, of modern, modern societies, fraternal societies. Um, but it's definitely the point, it's definitely the case that there are more, there are more people involved in fraternities, in fraternal organizations than ever before. Um, maybe in some ways, you know, who knows, ever again, perhaps, um, um, at least proportionally. Um, um, but in some ways, I think we've sort of forgotten that there's an earlier period, a sort of another golden age, um, which is really just masonry itself. Um, and I think a good, ex good introduction to that maybe is the sense that, that Henry Clay had. Henry Clay, the great, the great leader of the, one of the great leaders of the, of the antebellum period, um, the 1830s, 40s, and 50s. Um, the guy who was known as the great compromiser, the guy who, who repeatedly um, saw two, this, two, two opposite sides and would figure out a way to, to over, overcome them. Um, the Missouri Compromise, the, um, the Compromise of 1850, um, all things which you know, go to smash pretty quickly, but nonetheless, actually not the Missouri Compromise. Um, um, so a key figure, um, one of those guys who are never president yet is, is extremely important in that history of things. Uh, but he comes to Lexington, Kentucky as a young man. He's not yet 21. Um, and, and he tells the Senate in 1842, you can just see him, the huge figure there, talking about his past, went from, he went as an orphan, would not yet attain the age of majority, and that is 21 years old, poor, penniless, without the favor of the great, scarcely had I set foot on her generous soil, on Kentucky's generous soil, when I was seized and embraced with parental fondness and patronized with liberal and un unbounded munificence. So this sense of, of finding a home, of finding a, finding a family there is such, that's sort of the, 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 um, the deep metaphor there. Um, and here's this, this is sort of the best picture we have of Clay. Uh, this is not him at age 20 or 19. Um, this is a little later. But this is, this is long enough so we actually have a real photo of him. This is one of the problems of doing our American history. No photos and of course even more significant later on if we had film, of course we could do, we could be Ken Burns, but we had barely that. So, so this is him very old and uh, looks like decrepit here. And, and this is the young Henry Clay, um, get the sense of the, um, and they are looking from different ways. So perhaps he has a bad side. And, Sort of thing. It's like, it's like movie stars, you know. The, the so, last it's about 18, yes, that kind of um, sense. A little bit messy in the hair there, but um, not the greatest of hair dressing. But, um, but there he is there. Um, and so, so I guess part of that is to give you a chance, me a chance to say thank you for, you guys have been so nice and so generous and you've, and you've come back after an hour, which seems shocking to me. Um, um, but, but Clay, you know, at this point, he's an adult, he's not, not, not a child. Um, so I think in some ways it's not that he, need, he needed a family um, there. In some ways, um, you know, he needed sort of brothers. He, needs, he needed people to, to, to get together with, to do things with, to help each other. Um, and that's sort of what happens. Um, um, James, James Brown um, was not, Fortunately, the guy who goes on to become the great, one of the great figures of 20th century popular music, um, not the guy who can dance like that, although it'd be cool if he could, uh, because he does become Secretary of State. I think be, he'd be getting off the plane and giving a wow, sort of thing. Uh, but James Brown um, gives, is some one of the key figures in helping Clay um, actually becomes, they become literal brother-in-laws. They marry into the same family. 
And so Henry, Henry Clay named one of his child, children, James Brown Clay, um, thankfully a boy, right? So it's the, um, and this is about the time his, his, his son was born um, there. Um, but even before then, Clay and James Brown are Masonic brothers as well. So they're eventually, they're real, they're actually um, by law, brothers-in-law, or whatever the term is, I guess not legally brothers-in-law, but that's the, um, through marriage that way, um, they're Masonic brothers. So, um, and so I want to talk about why that, why, why brotherhood and, and the brotherhood is so um, significant um, in the generation after the revolution. Um, and so, so what is this golden age? What is this period when, when, James, uh, when James Brown is, is helping Clay and and Henry Clay is feeling this sense of uh, entering into the community, which is partly in some ways is that, is that Masonic tie there, although probably somebody could get along with all sorts of people and would make, make friends sort of in all that way. Um, um, and partly this is part of the fact that so many people in these years are becoming Masons. It's incredibly popular. Um, we talked about the, um, um, we talked about the revolution, so you have a sense of of that great growth in the in the Continental Army, um, in many ways that's sort of starving the masonry back back home. Um, um, so there are all sorts of problems. Takes a while, um, but after things after the revolution, in some ways uh, begins to heal things more. Um, but when you get to the 1780s, late 1780s, you are having a period of kind of explosive growth, which continues up through the 18-teens, maybe 1820s, um, with sort of New York as its epicenter, at least the part where you can see it most clearly. The, um, 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 had about 10 lodges before the revolution, you know, just beginnings of double digits before the revolution. By 1806, you have 100, nearly 100 by then. Um, DeWitt Clinton, the, the guy who's going to become governor of uh, New York says, every day produces new applications for lodges, and every place witnesses them. By, by 1825, nearly 500 lodges. So virtually, if you live in New York, um, virtually any part of New York, if your town doesn't have a lodge, then presumably the town next to it does, um, or at least the nearest important town has one. Um, so a huge kind of thing. Um, somebody, a group in 1828 says, you know, a cool observer cannot but look back at this growth with astonishment. Astonishment. Uh, now, of course, America itself is growing rapidly. There's a whole bunch of more Americans developing. But it's, but, and this is sort of a period when, you know, 1790 to 1830, when the population triples three times the number of Americans um, in, the, in that sort of 40 years. But masonry, I think, it, at least quadruples. So they have to do a lot of running just to keep up in the first place. This is, this is even more, um, even more, more growth. Um, the uh, new Grand Lodges, um, huge kind of growth. The uh, um, um, average of a new Grand Lodge every two years for the 40 years after 1786. Uh, so. So it's sort of thing that, um, or a new Grand Lodge every, every two years. So it's grown with the nation's growth and strengthened with their strength, says a Freemason in 1810. Um, and this is sort of spreading in all sorts of ways. Um, it's in some ways it's an urban sort of thing. Um, all sorts of, if you look at New York City, essentially um, 88, uh, sorry, 44 lodges just in New York City. 1825, so huge numbers of things bringing together sort of um, um, often very learned people. This is, this is DeWitt Clinton, the, um, um, this kind of extraordinary figure. I've already, already mentioned him. He is, the, uh, he, is, he is candidate for president um, several times, um, and our, our Alexander Hamilton um, person would probably support um, DeWitt Clinton, uh, um, but he is uh, deeply learned, president of all sorts of organizations, the American Bible Society. He is 
um, the first president of that. Um, he is the man who, more than anybody else, um, creates the Erie Canal. Um, when people said, this is ridiculous, what a stupid idea. You know, 300 miles of, of a ditch, remember it's called Clinton's Ditch, All right, for a while, people are mocking it. He says the engineering can be done, the engineering's there. Um, so he's there, he's, he's, uh, he is a mason, this very urban kind of guy, but also villages. And in fact, village, the rise of village masonry, of small town masonry, is really in some ways one of the biggest stories of this whole period. 90% um, of the lodges in New York in, in this period are actually, are actually in, in towns outside New York City, even though we already seen a huge sort of thing. And here we have, um, here we have a clear sort of small town kind of mason guy who's um, had, just has a drawing done of his wife here. I've cut that off so you can see um, here, but he shows himself actually this similar to the, uh, probably a few years later, similar to the Henry Clay look um, there, but he is wearing his, he's wearing his jewel, his sash and his apron. Um, so it's part of the, so it's that part of the world. So, um, so perhaps 80,000 Masons in America by the mid 1820s. Um, and I think that's probably another count. But at least that many, I'm going to say. The, um, so about 5% about to the adult white males. Of course, we say white males because um, Africans, Americans are kept out uh, formally of, of official masonry. The, and this is why they create their own kind of um, sort of parallel structures in that um, in Prince Hall masonry, which is also kind of growing in these years. By the, by the 1820s, you're getting some more definition and spreading to spreading to Philadelphia where, um, where people like Richard Allen and those guys are, are getting involved in, in creating that kind of thing. Um, um, so, um, and actually in that kind of level, not, it's not kind of that extraordinary, um, um, extraordinarily different. Uh, 1990, perhaps 3% um, of adult white males are, are, are Masons. Um, 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 so, so this is a period of, of enormous growth, of very great popularity, but I'm going to also suggest of enormous prestige, uh, of great, of great, there's a great sense of public significance, uh, masonry. Um, so I want to look at that. Why should that be? Why is this the period when, when Freemasonry is not only growing in numbers, but it's also growing in its, in its sort of significance and its public sort of, uh, public sort of, um, uh, profile. Um, so I want to want to look at three sort of aspects to that sort of, um, I th and three sort of building sort of things that Masons are building in three kinds of ways: building a new society, so the social aspect of this; building a new nation. There's this larger sense of Masonry having that broad kind of thing, and and building new selves of people sort of um, think dealing with individuals in that way. Um, so, so building a new society, growing uses for these things. It's connected with the social world. This is a, this is a society with it changing rapidly, a society when people are moving around more than ever before, going from place to place, um, trying to settle down in new kinds of ways, trying to create new businesses which span all these new localities. Um, this is beginning to uh, develop that. Charity, of course, becomes increasingly important. Um, these are these are trying to deal with all the problems, the rise of this sort of modern, this modern um, capitalist sort of system, um, um, and Tyler Royal and and Tyler Royler, who was a, who is a, um, who is a newspaper editor in, um, in Washington, one of the first women newspaper editors, and uh, a famously tart tongue kind of woman, um, but just loved Freemasonry. Um, she called Masons the most charitable and benevolent of the human race. Um, there, the uh, and this is partly not only charity but mutual aid too, Make, helping Masons to help um, to help you and to help others, um, um, creating ties, um, helping people move beyond the locality. One reason that Royal had that sort of thing is that she had begun to write travel books. She was moving from place to place. 
Um, and so she had a sense of those kind of things. Um, and in some ways, this is what makes people human, they began to argue. So, so Mason Locke Weems, of course, we know him as the great, uh, the great, the author of the great life of George Washington, the, the, um, the person who first wrote down the cherry tree, perhaps made up the cherry tree story, um, um, it argues to Freemasons. He is himself a Freemason. In fact, those early, those early editions, even of George Washington's biography, it identifies him as a Freemason. Um, and so um, it's only later that he identifies himself as as the rector at Mount Vernon, at Mount Vernon Parish. Um, um, 1793, um, he writes, man without society was only a miserable orangutan who lives infinite degrees below that state of dignity and happiness for which he was created. Um, so that society, of course, is built partly by Freemasonry. Uh, DeWitt Clinton talked about an artificial consanguinity. You can see here's the very learned kind of guy. Artificial, this is something created, an artificial sense of blood connections. So from a world in which family ties were incredibly important, from that British world where, where who your parents were was quite often the most important thing about you. You know, where did you start in, this, in the where did you start in the world? That's a pretty good indication of where you're going to end up. Masonry comes a way of breaking away from that, creating that artificial sense of blood ties. Uh, in fact, is he said it's a it, it, these ties which operate with as much force and effect as the natural relationship of blood. Uh, so you could use Masonic ties around the world. Here's a um, here's a Here's a Masonic certificate which, which actually talks about um, the Masonic family and actually sort of a sense of the globe here, there, and um, with, the, uh, with the anchor not only of hope, I think, but of, of travel there as well. The, um, and of course, when you're a member of that family, this is a particularly influential kind of family as well. These are people who are, who are key kind of figures. And so, and so when Charles Finney, the guy um, who is going to become the most important uh, preacher of the entire early 19th century, the guy who was going to create the modern revival um, in many ways. Um, um, when he is a young man, he's about to leave home, um, his uncle comes to him and says, join the fraternity, become a Mason. Um, because if I were a Freemason, I should find friends everywhere. Um, um, and it's not just for travelers. But it's also people staying at home who are business people who want to make that kind of connections, who want to deal with people they barely know. Today we have, we have PayPal. We have, we have our Discover card, our, our Visa card. You know, those are everywhere we want, to, we want them to be, everywhere we want to be, right? That's right, right? And that's, and that's the problem, right? What they're saying is, you know, you're going all sorts of places. You're dealing with all sorts of things. So we have all sorts of we have all sorts of commercial, all sorts of institutional ways to deal with that. Back then, they didn't have those kind of things. So Masonic ties are really important for that. Um, you know, how do you create a reputation? How do people know you are somebody of standing? Right? Today, you can sh you, they check your credit rating. They check your credit rating if you're applying for a lot of jobs today. Right? They, they go to a, a national group which has terrible information on you, but they trust that. You know, back then didn't have that sort of thing. And so, you know, I'm a Freemason. That had, that had deeper kind of meaning. So, um, so, so masonry is part of that sense of, how, of dealing with this broader kind of world. Um, also had a, pub, a connection with the public world as well. Masonry um, is important in building the nation, in building a new society. Remember, they're trying to do that in the revolution. After the revolution, they're, they're attempting to, uh, uh, they're attempting to go beyond, um, go beyond the older world, go create, create a new society, a Republican society, um, which broke away from things. How do you do that? For a lot of people, it seemed to be masonry was the way to do that. 
Um, so it was a way to do so. It was linked through religion, right? Um, a, sense of, a sense of building a religion which is not based on, on public, which is not based on official government support. How do you do that? Well, masonry helps to encourage that kind of thing. Um, masonry helps to spread those kind of values. This is one of my, um, one of my favorite um, images from the period. Um, this, is, um, um, this is, I think, originally a British um, thing, but it, became, it was spread around in America as well. This is, um, this is, this is the Freemason's heart. This is a representation of what you know, the central values of the Freemason. Um, it's all, all under the all-seeing eye of God, of course, all within the, all within the compass. Um, um, you, have, you have freedom here. You have, um, I'm not sure what that is actually now that we're in my close sort of ways here, but here are all the different sort of virtues which Freemasons have, the um, affability, um, justice, politeness, all these things in the center, G God, um, and and sort of the uh, Pythagoreans kind of ge geometric sort of things as well. So they're um, so very religious sort of sense. And lodges um, often gave degrees to free to ministers without charge. Often allowed um, in smaller towns allowed churches to meet in their halls. Um, so you have that one lo extraordinary kind of lodge in Lynchburg. Virginia, which builds a building, uh, which is rare in that thing. So over the years, within a few years, you have Baptists, Episcopalians, Methodists, and Presbyterians, all, all holding meetings at different times there. So kind of extraordinary sort of thing there. Um, 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 so, so religion. But it's not just religion in itself. It's also morality. And of course, religion is seen as part of morality. But Masons were seen as teaching values sort of by themselves. Um, um, rituals and symbols were supposed to teach um, moral kinds of lessons um, and teach them through, do we have that? No. Hmm. OK. Um, to teach them through, through a variety of, of media. Today we talk about mixed media, sort of immersive experiences, right? Um, Talk about you know those kind of goggles that make you have a sense of, of an entire world. In a way, that's what the lodge was meant to be, with the idea, with this kind of deep psychology behind it. Not just wouldn't this be cool if we could do it, uh, but with a sense that if you if you if you have some sort of major experience along with the teaching, then that will make a stronger kind of lesson for you. Uh, uh, um, this is the, the lodges also form sort of a discipline kind of thing, um, and so all these things seem to make masonry a foundation of social development. Um, and Ann Tyler Royal, remember our uh, thing here? She's a little more tart tongue there. Um, she says masonry is the great instrument of civilization. It's what creates it. Uh, if it were not for Freemasonry, you can just imagine the. Uh, if it were not for Freemasonry, the world would become a herd of savages. <laughs> they would just fall apart. We'd be um, crazed. If it had not been for Masonry, it never would have been anything else but savages. So the thing that built up society, which made it human, which made it livable, and then the thing that's holding it together. So. Obviously, pretty strong, and not everybody thought that strongly, but it's sort of a common kind of vision of things. Um, and so you can have a sense of this. Um, and another of my favorite images from this period, uh, this is actually oddly a, the frontispiece, the, the sort of opening page, the title page, and then the, and then the, and then the page opposite. Uh, this is the frontispiece of a, of a songster, that is a, a uh, book of lyrics of different songs, um, with the idea clearly being that Masons would buy it and sing, sing songs during the, during the meetings. Uh, but, and it was the Nightingale of Liberty was the title of the, of the song. This is why you have this Nightingale up here, by the way. It's not just some sort of weird sort of, you know, posed raven looking down kind of creepily. Um, but what I think is very cool here, if you look here, you know, here's, here's George Washington being commemorated here. This is, this is a symbol of, 
of liberty, liberty cap, but also in a sense a symbol of America on there. But if you look more closely, you can see, you know, here's America wearing an apron, square and compass apron. So, the, so, so America, as in a sense, as Masonic, has that same kind of connection. Um, so it's a very public sort of thing, a public sort of idea. Um, but there's a final element here. I want to talk about, remember, creating society, creating a nation, creating selves. There's also, also masonry is becoming more and more a kind of a world in itself, a kind of, in some ways, a kind of separate place. Um, and sort of in a way today, right, you guys have a sort of a world of that. If you're, you know, the Scottish Rite is, is only something which goes alongside the lodges. And then, then probably some of you are involved with other kinds of groups, which are Masonic and, and other kinds of things. And that's, um, and that's in some ways coming out, um, coming out here. It's just in, more and more it has that sense of being an organized association, more highly organized. Um, um, so there are more, um, more Masonic printing, more and more things to read about Freemasonry. Um, um, only about three dozen things had been published about masonry at all before the revolution. Yet in the 1790s, about 400. Uh, more than 1,400 in the 1820s, kind of extraordinary kind of thing. Um, and here, um, there's the, wow, I don't know what happened to it. Um, but anyway, there is a, um, I can't show you the image from the front of, there we have actually, this is a Masonic minstrel. Um, the, um, a, another songbook, by the way, so this is very common in the Sonic songbooks in this period. Um, but here we have this kind of amazing, amazing drawing here. This is the frontispiece of that. We'll talk some more about what's going on there um, later on, I hope. Um, but um, the fact, this is an extraordinarily uh, successful book. Um, at this point, it's often it's common to get subscribers to your to your book in order to make sure there were, you know, to make sure there's enough, um, enough demand to print. Uh, this, the Masonic Minstrel, as far as I know, is the most number of subscribers in any book in this entire period, 12,000 subscribers. That's amazing, amazing sort of thing. So it's, it's a sign of the sort of Masonic involvement with things. Um, proceedings of state bodies. You guys all know those, you have a sense of these things, right? This develop in these in this year, in these years. This is the first to do these kind of things, um, um, and and this is not just a matter of of more bureaucracy. It's a matter of more interest in in rituals. Um, this is um, the the rituals are becoming important to themselves. Of course, they had rituals right from the beginning. You know, right? Remember, I just suggested at the beginning that was one of the reasons why they thought they were doing getting involved with Freemasonry. Uh, but it was the sort of thing, once it was sort of set over time, it became something people did. It became something that, that was a way which became a Mason, but didn't have a huge significance in itself. In the years after the American Revolution, these things become things which do have that kind of significance. They are things which you need to study, things which you need to learn, things which you need to memorize. Right, the uh, Thomas Smith Webb, the um, um, sort of the guy who writes the most important Masonic handbook of that period, also writes a number of Masonic songs. This is, this is more of a theme than I thought. Um, but one of, his, one of his most popular songs is I Sing the Mason's Glory. I Sing the Mason's Glory, um, whose prying eye doth burn unto complete perfection her mysteries to learn. I don't have the world music with me, but I've been known to sing that, and um, you can be grateful that I don't um, here. But, um, but, but then goes on to say, it's, he's not celebrating people who go to the lodge to eat and drink to do that, but only those at meetings, um, only those, well, I can't remember the, uh, but only people who, who want to tr improve them, who through lectures are going to improve themselves in glorious masonry. So, and of course, as a, as a college professor, I always think not many songs celebrating lectures, but 
course, as we know, lectures are a different thing back then. Uh, but, but he is celebrating sort of involvement with the ritual, spending a lot of time learning it, spending a lot of time uh, memorizing it. So there's that sort of sense, greater attention to lodge rooms. I think we have to go back here. We have, um, here we have actually this, this amazing lodge room in, in Aurora, New York, which is a very small town. Um, there, the, actually the very first picture in my book um, uh, was a picture taken by my wife of that, of that building. Um, but it's still extraordinarily there. Um, this is all painted on the walls. Um, you get the sense of this huge um, involvement with these, these sort of sense of things. Um, 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 uh, but, um, but it's spread through all sorts of ways, but it's not just interest in rituals. It's also interest in further degrees, these higher degrees. I already mentioned the Scottish Rite, right? Um, um, the higher degrees, you know, beyond there, it really still, um, the 1860s or so, you know, there are a number of degrees floating around, but they're not that important. You know, it's really those, those three degrees plus the Royal Arch, which are seen as the center of things, and that's sort of it. Um, but, more and more, people are beginning to spread new sorts of things. The Scottish Rite famously begins around, right around the turn of the century, um, although it doesn't become extremely popular until the 20th century. Um, but it's the York Rite, um, which is important, and that's Thomas Smith Webb, who's the guy who pushes those things. He's the guy um, who sings the Mason's Glory, um, who's, who you know, moves on through those Knights Templar, through the through the royal arch degrees, all those things, helping to write those rituals, make them, make them standardized, and make them more theatrical, kind of this extraordinary theatrical experience for these people. Uh, um, now, of course, I think I want to, before we leave that, of course, I need to note that this is not simply a matter of um, uh, people, of masons separating themselves from the world you know, withdrawing fully um, and doing something completely different than the world. Um, um, this is also, a, this is also a, a way for people to engage with other parts of their culture as well. This is also the period when, when you have a new interest in the, in the, public, in the public realm. You have a new interest in uh, private sort of experiences. This is the age of the novel when people sit and maybe people are frightened by the novel at this point because you're, you're sitting around being fascinated by a story which is not real and you're not paying attention to other people around you. It seems sort of scary, especially for women. Uh, so, and that's the kind of thing that Masons are sort of um, being involved with, the Knights Templar, right? You're thinking about medieval knights, right? This is the period of Sir Walter Scott when, you know, stories about about knights and daring do, those kind of things. Here you can become a, you can, you can become a knight in your locality. It's an extraordinary kind of thing. Um, so, so the masonry is part of that broader kind of world. Um, 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 and let me finish by saying, this is why, because I, um, um, let me finish with this, with the way, at least for this part of the discussion, with the um, uh, with the rise of cornerstone layings, which I think is sort of the ultimate um, sense of the importance of Freemasonry in these years, and that's the and that's the practice, which really for America begins in these years, you know, of of saying it's it's time for us to, to commemorate the beginning of a building to make this building in some ways separate from the world, in some ways um, special for the community. How do you do that? The cornerstone laying, who is it who is going to be the best representatives of the nation? Who is it that's going to best represent the new society we want to create? There's no king anymore, so you can't have the king or his relatives come in, have his appointment, the royal appointment to this guy is going to do this. Can't do that. You don't have a king anymore. Um, you, you can't just have the government appoint somebody because you don't want you don't want people to you don't want people to worship the government. That's not um, religion. Sounds good. 
religious, you want to bring that sort of sense of sacredness of holiness. But who's going to represent religion? You know, well, let's bring in the Methodist minister. We're not a Methodist nation, right? He represents Methodism, not necessarily Christianity of itself. So the Masonic order is brought in. Masons are brought in to represent those values, to represent those extraordinary aspirations, but doing it without being connected with the older kind of symbols of the world, but instead symbols in the new kind of world. Um, so, so, the, so September 18th, 1793, you have, you have George Washington dedicating the United States Capitol. Here we have the great symbol of the new nation, the center of government. Of course, today we think of the White House as being the center, and to a certain extent it is. But the, what Americans in those years wanted to move away from having a single, single, a single person in charge. They wanted the representatives of the people to do that. So the, so the Capitol is the most important building of this. And so for that, they bring in the Freemasons. They built, later build, bring in the Masons to do the White House as well, by the way. But, uh, so the president leads that ceremony. Uh, the stone's already there. They bring a plate to put on it. Um, I'll just say a few words, actually. I, you know, I never really realized what a cornerstone laying was. I, I always thought that they had this fancy stone that had engraved in it all the fancy things on it. I now, reckon, I now realize, I think this weekend, that they, they probably didn't do that. This is probably a building stone, a regular sort of thing. Uh, the thing that was important was bringing in that plate to put it on there. That was the sort of thing. And then you cover it with corn, oil, and wine, the sort of symbols of of prosperity and of God's blessing on things um, there. So, and so that's what happens there. And, and the plate, just like plates generally do, you know, not only talks about the year of independence for America, so beginning dating with the new nation, but also Masonic dating as well, the year of light, right, the, the 4,000 years additional kind of things. Um, and people turn to this more and more in these years. And here's, here's what we're looking for before. The, uh, um, this, is, this is the only example that I know of of one of those plates, which is still there, um, which is still uh, visible. This is actually a plate which is in Chapel Hill, kind of extraordinarily. The university, yeah, this is the, this is the, um, this is the, this is the um, you know, old East building. Um, now a women's dormitory. I was a little bit disappointed because that was the, it was the central building. It was everything at that point. It probably didn't have women in it either. So um, not that that bothers me, but um, but it was the it was the most important building. Now it's um, sort of bring out and actually has two sides: a Latin side and an English side. So this is kind of a substantial kind of thing. Um, the um, the Grand Master comes in and does this, assisted by all these people. The cornerstone of this edifice. Um, there, so that's what they brought in. They placed it on there, and they want to build on top of it. There, um, and actually, this is kind of extraordinary because uh, this building um, was really the second major cornerstone laying. Um, in some ways, the second, um, the one right after the Capitol building. This is the following month um, in October. Although they they'd already done that sort of thing because um, rather extraordinarily. Um, when they, had, when they had figured out the boundaries of, of the District of Columbia, when they had created the federal district, um, they had dedicated the cornerstones, the different parts of that. And this is the main one. This is the first one, by the way. This is, the, as far as I know, the only ones left. They went around later and made them a lot better. You can see what happened to it. It's kind of not in good shape. In fact, it's close to being in the water now. Um, um, but, but there it is, um, maybe 1791, I'm thinking, something of that sort. So you have that, and then, and then, and then you, another famous cornerstone laying is the Bunker Hill Monument. This is Bunker Hill outside, outside of Boston, uh, um, celebrate, which is actually a, a, an, a, a building which is a, a, a monument which is started um, by, not only by local Masons, but by a great visiting Mason, uh, the, the greatest celebrity in America at that point, um, the Marquis de Lafayette, 
Remember the guy who'd come over from France to, um, to help Americans win their independence? Um, became sort of an adoptive son to George Washington. Amazingly, is still alive and still active in the mid-1820s. Mid comes back to America and is greeted throughout the United States um, and asked to be part of this cornerstone laying. So extraordinarily, he's there. He is, they called him the nation's guest. <coughs> Virtually everywhere, by the way. He, everywhere he came, uh, Masons would kind of, would kind of take, take responsibility. They were the people who would, who would organize the dinners. They would, they, would, they would have a special meeting to bring, to say thank you to, to Lafayette, who was a Freemason, by the way. So, so you have that sort of thing. So, so it's so representing the sort of the, the values of the nation's life there. Um, all right. Having said this and having exhausted you guys a little bit, let me just, let me just say a few words about what happens at the end. What's the end of the story? Um, and I wish the story was, the end of the story was a little nicer. This is not a great fairy story, uh, not a great children's story. Um, and in talking about this, in some ways, you know, I was sort of reminded of, of Joe Lewis's famous saying, remember George, Joe Lewis the Great, the great heavyweight champion. Um, and they said to him when, they said to him when he is about to meet a really, a really kind of fearsome opponent, this really big guy, he said, aren't you frightened by this? And he said, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. You know, this guy may be big. That just means when he falls, that's going to be, that's going to be a pretty big fall, right? The, um, and the way that's, that's the end of the story here for this golden age. You know, the masonry becomes extremely big. Uh, but then it says it's equally extraordinary kind of decline. Um, set off by a whole series of things, which I can talk about if you ask me about. Um, but essentially, uh, people begin to fear that Freemasonry is undermining the nation. It's undermining religion. Um, and you have the beginnings of this anti-Masonic period. Anti-Masonic period, an anti-Masonic uh, movement, an anti-Masonic party. Really, the first sort of major third party um, in American history that creates the first political convention in American history. Um, uh, but they, they sort of uh, virtually lay waste to um, Freemasonry. Um, um, there are actually two lodges um, in the north, which two grand lodges in the north, two sort of entire states that, that sort of Masonry essentially shuts down. Um, there are many other places up uh, there. It's, things go on just by a few devoted brothers. People have been initiated years before. Sometimes they just meet once a year, make sure they fulfill their charter, put it away, hide it for a year. Um, in the South, there's no anti-Masonic movement, but even there, anti-Masonry has a you know, huge decline there as well. Um, so, so dramatic kind of ending to that. The, um, um, but I was also thinking in some ways that maybe the, you know, the, to give this a more hopeful ending, because it's not the end of, of the story of Freemasonry. Um, you know, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. But also in some ways, sometimes, you know, the bigger they come back. And that's what happens here, that, um, that Mason re returns even larger than ever. Uh, huge growth, dramatic growth, leading to part of that, that golden age of fraternalism there. The, um, and I love the statistic, which is kind of amazing. 1855 to 1870, 20-year period more people become Masons in Pennsylvania in those years, in those 20 years, more people become Masons that, in those years than became Masons in all of Masonic history in Pennsylvania before that. That's like amazing. That's like um, extraordinary kind of development, extraordinary kind of thing. And Philadelphia was not a, a backwater, a frontier. It was had the earliest earliest sort of documented lodge in America. So huge kind of growth, dramatic kind of things. Um, the Scottish Rite, of course, the great success story of the, of the early 20th century. Um, amazing kind of growth. Um, but it currently grows back by not being such a loud and demanding and 
um, group which, which made such demands on the, on the world, which said, aren't we extraordinary? God created us. We don't do that sort of thing. Um, so it actually is less, less frightening to people. Um, but also, it also spreads this fraternal idea, this vision of how do you do this. Masonry is, masonry is in some ways this extraordinary technique of organizing societies. Before you had the internet, before you had, before you had telephones even, how do you create a society where people can't can communicate? How do you run a, how do you have a national society, an international society, which doesn't have a kind of um, immediate kind of communication things? Well, well, the fraternal model is the way you do that, and people learn that from Freemasonry, and people people used that model more and more. This was the period when, when masonry becomes sort of the, not, not just a brother to fraternities, but a sort of godfather to them. People, people, people steal from masonry shamelessly. It's like a, it's like a popular, you know, popular movie or a popular TV show, right? You get, you get a sort of, you get a sort of thing, you get Star Wars. No one thought you could have a, a huge, a huge science fiction movie which, which got everybody involved. Well, so what, pe what happens? For 40 years, you have people stealing things from Star Wars, all right? That's, that's what masonry is. It's the Star Wars of the, it's not the Death Star, thank goodness. It's the, it's the, it's the Empire, I guess. It's the, but, but they are, um, uh, so all sorts of things. The, the Odd Fellows, um, college fraternities, um, the Grange, the, 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 um, the Grand Army of the Republic, the greatest, the greatest um, fraternal society, the greatest new fraternal society of the late 19th century, the, the greatest sort of political pressure group sort of created. Um, and the origins of modern life insurance, right? You all, all sorts of, remember all sorts of life insurances used to be fraternal life insurances. That's, they drew upon that Masonic model to develop that thing. So. So an extraordinary uh, set of things. So in some ways, we'll leave it there with the bridge to that first golden age of American fraternity. All right, so thank you. Thank you. Ooh, I'm little, sorry for going on so long, especially when you came back. I shouldn't have tried your patience so much. Was, yes, uh, yes. I was curious on the, on the fall of Freemasonry. Uh, was America more upset by the Morgan affair or by the corruption and the actions of Andrew Jackson to try to, um, to actually begin like the anti-Masonic party to get uh, John Quincy Adams involved with that as well? It does. It does have a. It does have kind of a political sort of thing. Um, I, you know, I, I tend to, I tend to think that the, that the. Um, that the political element comes later in some ways is, is not quite a separate thing, but it's not that distinct. The, um, and it's sort of suggested by the fact that, um, that the people they run quite often, the higher they go, the higher the, the, higher the office, the less likely it is even that even the people that run for them even gonna support, even really support anti-masonry. Right. So it's kind of this amazing sort of thing. The, um, so, so William Wirt, the, who was a major figure at this point, he's the guy who, um, um, if we have Mason Lock Weems, you know, the cherry tree story, you know, not chopping down the cherry tree, but barking it pretty badly, um, you know, creating that. He, um, you have William Wirt, who is the guy who, um, you know, publishes and makes famous, you know, Patrick Henry, give me liberty or give me death, which I think might be some early, early sort of stories about, but it, you know, it's not in the original documents about that sort of thing, I don't think. Um, but he, you know, he, he all but says, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna attack Masons. You know, that's, um, he doesn't say this is a stupid idea, but, but he's pretty, so I think, I think that's something which is you, they use that to, um, they use anti-Masonry to create an idea of reform and of those kind of things. Wasn't Wirt, wasn't he a Mason? Wirt? Um, he, he may well have been. He was a presidential candidate for the end. But I yeah, think was he? The, it wouldn't Mason. surprise me. Yeah. Although I think he's probably a lapsed Mason by then. So the, um, uh, he was two years, two years after. 
<laughs> and frankly, and frankly, yeah, yeah. I want to see how the election went first. <laughs> see what happens. I think he's lapped before then, but yes. And frankly, that's, that was actually the common pattern. Actually, what's so extraordinary about the current experience we're having is that in these years, masonry tended to be a, a, young, a young man sort of thing. Um, you did it as, as a young man, um, as part of your settling in society, part of making those connections, part of establishing yourself. And quite often at that point, then you would sort of withdraw or you would sort of step back. And so Henry Clay, who was a pretty active Freemason, pretty um, thing, actually asks to be, you know, to demit from the lodge. Um, he's not part of that um, activity. Now he does, he's involved with the idea of a general grand master, 1822 um, there, but I think at that point he's not an active mason in that way. So um, in a way there's nothing wrong with that. I think there's, you know, today's, today's masonry is, is so heavily built around dues and, and that sort of income that that's, you know, that's, that's sort of a virtual kind of thing you have to keep up you have to do that. You know, no one would have had trouble, you know, talking about Ma Clay as a Mason, even though in his formal sort of sense had, you know, sort of become a hibernating Mason or something of that sort of. Um, so, all right. So I've exhausted the thing without. I don't know if I've answered the question. At least my view of things. The, yeah. Is that good enough? Um, anybody else? Are we? I don't want to try your patience here. I already have. But thank you so much, and I, I'm so you grateful. Want to take this application again. <laughs> well, Dr. Bullock, thank you very much for uh, thank you. coming and sharing with Thank us. you. I'm so honored yes, to be really able to do it. it. So. Uh, after we adjourn here, uh, Dr. Bullock will have his books available. So uh, please take advantage of an opportunity to have the book signed. And, 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 if you, yeah, and if you brought one.